We'll start with 35,000. 35,000. So it's estimated that the average adult makes more than 35,000 decisions each and every day. Now, I've got to know, is that more or less than what you thought? Is that more or less than what you thought? Pop that in the, pop the word more or the word less in the chat box and let me know. Yeah, 35,000 is daily, every single day. Yes, we make more than 35,000 decisions each and every single day. Decisions of all shapes and sizes ranging from should I hit the snooze button to what should I wear today to should I hire that person or this person to, okay, what should I do next on my to-do list? Now, if we assume that most of us are getting somewhere around the seven to nine hours of sleep a night that are recommended for the average adult. So let's say eight hours of sleep a night. So maybe if you're a parent to young children, I have a toddler and a one-year-old, um, you might be getting a little bit less sleep, but assuming eight hours of sleep, that rounds out to a little more than 2000 decisions an hour. 2,000 decisions an hour, which then trickles down to an average of 33 decisions in a single minute. 33 decisions every minute. So because our decisions come in all shapes and sizes, some are big, life-changing decisions, and then some are so small that we barely notice them, we're almost constantly in decision-making mode. And also just for fun, any guesses what this number means? 250, any guesses what this number means? And put your best guess in the chat box. I'd love to know. What do you think this 250 means? I'd love to know what you think. Any guesses? What could 250 be? So every day, we make roughly 250 decisions just about food, <laughs> just about food, 250 decisions just about food, adding items to the grocery list, what we'll eat for dinner, when we'll eat dinner, should we have a healthy snack or should we have ice cream, um, where are we going to go to eat for our birthday, we are, we're making around 250 decisions about food every single day. Um, and speaking of food, I I'm not sure that it was decision fatigue induced, but food actually played a role in one of my past career moves. So let me tell you just a little bit about who I am and what exactly I mean by that. So I actually kicked off my career in the marble halls, marble halls of Congress as a scheduler to a United States congressman, managing one of the most hectic calendars in the country. I spent what felt like 10 to 12 hours a day rearranging appointments on a calendar, and I fielded hundreds of meeting requests, speaking invitations, reception details, not to mention committee meetings and votes. But I'm from Louisiana. And I don't know if you know this, but Louisiana is internationally known for its cuisine. And I really began to miss home, including Louisiana cuisine like boiled crawfish, etouffee, jambalaya, and gumbo. So I moved from DC back to Louisiana and began a decade long career in the high stakes world of crisis communications and government affairs, uh, hurricanes, oil spills, tornadoes, droughts, plant explosions, nonprofit embezzlement schemes, universities on the brink of financial collapse, you name it. And I've probably escorted someone down a freight elevator and into a back alley to avoid TV cameras waiting outside. So as you can imagine, that 24 seven life really began to take its toll and I was burned out big time. Um, and so like so many others who have felt uh, extreme burnout, I walked away in search of a better way of life. And after digging into every time management and productivity book under the sun to try and figure out a better way, 
I became a time management coach, helping others create order out of chaos. And Rachel, you're right. I probably could do a whole hour just on that story. So now as a time management coach, I use my history of scheduling combined with burnout and crisis management to help others just like you stop feeling overwhelmed and start spending time on what matters most as head of community at Clockwise. So consider me your time management coach. And today we're diving into decision fatigue, a specifically how to combat decision fatigue with habits that stick. And we'll do that first by understanding what exactly decision fatigue is. Then we'll dive into why habits are the answer and a little about the anatomy of a habit. And then finally, I'll share five strategies for designing habits that stick. So, with so many decisions being made almost constantly day in and day out, it's no wonder that decision fatigue is so incredibly prevalent. So I would love to know, let me know in the chat box with just a simple yes or no. Have you ever felt decision fatigue before? So decision fatigue is the idea, here we go. There we go. Decision fatigue is the idea that after making so many decisions, a person's ability to make additional decisions becomes worse. So let me say that one more time. So decision fatigue is the idea that after making many decisions, a person's ability to make more decisions becomes worse. So that can lead to difficulty making the right decisions it can lead to impulse buying and other just bad decisions. And Jennifer, I love that strategy. I am I do that too. We actually pick out clothes every single Sunday so that we don't have to do any of it the night before. That is genius. Um, so think of your decision-making ability like this, a gas tank. So when you open your eyes each morning, you start your day with a full tank of decision-making fuel, but you've got a limited amount of fuel in your tank. Once you use it up, you don't get it back. And so each time you make a decision, you use just a little bit of that fuel. And of course, some decisions require more fuel than others. So as you make decisions throughout the day, your decision-making fuel gets lower and lower and lower until you have very little decision-making power available at the end of the day. And so when our fuel reserves are low, we're more prone to making bad decisions. So this is why so many bad decisions happen at night. When we've used so much of our decision-making power throughout the day, that suddenly standing in front of the freezer and eating ice cream straight out of the carton doesn't seem like a bad idea after all. I mean, who's with me? If you've ever made a late night snack decision, just put the word snack in the chat box and let me know I'm not alone. Because when you've made so many decisions throughout the day, <laughs> right? Exactly. It, 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 it's really tough to hang on to that willpower and, and skip the text. Right, Veronica, let's be honest. This, a snack really is the best decision ever. And, you know, just what's your favorite midnight snack? Let me know. Mine's ice cream every time. We, like, love the ice cream with a little bit of chocolate syrup. I even have these, this, like, bottle of unicorn sprinkles that are all different shapes, sizes, and colors, and textures. And it is such a fun, like, indulgence at night. But it's, I'm not going to make the decision to eat ice cream most of the time in the middle of the day. It's at the end of the day when my decision-making fuel is low that I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to eat the ice cream. So, but this plays out in ways a lot more, a lot that are a lot more serious than just than the ice cream dilemma late at night. So let's flashback. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you for letting me know that I deserve the ice cream. <laughs> maybe not every night, um, but maybe once in a while as a treat. So let's flashback, if you will, with me to March of 2020. 
to March of 2020, we all remember how the world and how things began changing for us in March of 2020. So you might have noticed in the spring of 2020, when many of us experienced the shift to remote work for the first time, that suddenly working from home, uh, being in Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, we found we felt more exhausted than ever before. Um, and, and if you felt that too, back in spring of 2020, just put exhausted in the chat box because you know, not only were we spending more time in front of Zoom, but we were completely thrown out of routines that had been ingrained for months, even years. We were completely thrown out of routines that we had created and that felt like second nature to us. All of a sudden, everything was different. And with every change to our routine, and there were many, we can agree, there were many changes to our routine, from a change in our commute to how we started our day, to if you had children, how children factored into your routine, to how long you spend working, to where you work. With every change to our routine, we had more decisions to make about how we would operate instead, how we would operate in this new way. And this avalanche of decision-making as we settled into new routines, new work styles, and new methods of collaboration depleted our decision-making fuel reserves faster than ever before. So the landscape of work is continuing to change every day. And the future of work is one of the hottest topics of discussion right now. And since we know that few things are more constant than change, how can we set ourselves up for success and combat decision fatigue along the way? Fortunately, the answer to combating decision fatigue is simple. Habits. <laughs> habits. So why habits? How is this going to magically fix all of our decision, decision fatigue problems? Well, in simplest terms, having habits in place means making fewer decisions. Seems pretty simple. And having fewer decisions to make means that you have more decision-making fuel for the decisions that really matter. Making, a making something a habit is like putting yourself on autopilot, like a good kind of autopilot, not the kind of zombie-like autopilot where you're sort of living in default mode, moving from thing to thing, but a good kind of autopilot so you don't waste precious, limited decision-making energy. Author John C. Maxwell once said, life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you. I got to say that one one more time. Life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you. If that resonates with you, just put the put that put a number 1 in the chat box because this is such an important reminder to me that every choice we make is it's a building block of who we are. It's a vote for the person that we want to become and it shapes who we are and how we show up. Life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you. So obviously you wanna set yourself up for the best choices you can because your life depends on it. No pressure, right? So let's zoom in on what a habit actually is. So habits can be broken down into three parts, the cue, the routine, and the reward. So in Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habits, he uses this three-part breakdown of habits. So there's another super popular book on habits called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, in his book, he breaks habits down even further into four parts, the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. For the sake of simplicity, today we'll be digging into Duig's three-part breakdown. So let's take a closer look at each one of these building blocks of a habit. So part one is the cue. 
So the Q, this is the thing that makes you, that happens. So this is the thing that happens that makes you think of doing the habit. This is that trigger. This is that, that thing that kicks off the autopilot. This is the thing that happens that makes you think of doing the habit. And as I'm telling you a little bit about each of these three parts, I encourage you to think of a habit that you currently have. Maybe it's something as simple as making your morning coffee or brushing your teeth in the morning or um, putting your sunglasses on whenever you get in the car. Choose a habit and try and think about what your cue is. So again, the cue is the thing that happens that makes you think of doing the habit. Part two is the routine. This is doing the habit, whatever the habit may be. And then part three is the reward. The reward can be intrinsic, the way that you feel after you do the habit, relaxed, accomplished, energized, whatever that internal feeling is, or the reward can be an external reward. So here's an example using something that's probably a habit for many of us, drinking a morning coffee or a tea. So if the cue is the thing that happens that makes you think of doing the habit, the cue might be seeing the coffee maker in your kitchen. Maybe the second you walk into your kitchen, you see the coffee maker and you think, oh, time to make coffee. It just, or maybe it's the moment your eyes open in the morning and you think, oh, I'm awake now, time to drink coffee. So that's the cue. The routine is then making the coffee. And the reward is enjoying the delicious taste of the coffee you've made, as well as that awake feeling once the caffeine comes in. Make sense? We've got the cue, we've got the routine, and we've got the reward. Understanding each of these three individual pieces of a habit is what is going to equip us with the ability to be more strategic than ever about designing habits. So now that we're all experts on the building blocks of habits, let's look at five ways that you can use habits to combat decision fatigue. First, know your why. So when you're crystal clear on your motivation for starting a habit, that gives you fuel to keep going when you don't feel like it. So let's say that you want to start a habit, um, you want to start meal planning. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you currently meal plan or how many of you want to start meal planning? Um, yes, this, this is Clockwise Office Hours where we talk about how to you know, increase our personal productivity in the workplace. But let's be honest, work and life blend together. We're, how we show up in our life affects how we show up at work and vice versa. And meal planning is a really great way to um, cut back on that decision fatigue by making a lot of decisions about what you're going to eat in advance. So, so let's say that you're interested in beginning a meal planning habit. When you're crystal clear on why you want to start meal planning, whenever you don't feel like doing it, returning to that why, returning to that motivation is what's going to help push you forward to actually following through on that habit. So any new habit that you want to start, I encourage you to clearly articulate why it is that you want to start this habit. Um, and you can actually take it just a step further. So let's say that you want to start meal planning because you want to uh, make healthier food choices. I would then encourage you to ask yourself that question again. Why do you want to make healthier food choices? Okay, well, I want to make healthier food choices so I can have more energy throughout the day. So then I would encourage you to ask that question one more time. Why do you want to have more energy throughout the day? Okay, well, I want to have more energy throughout the day so that I can show up as my best self for uh, my coworkers and for my family. And so when you arrive at that, okay, I want to start meal planning so I can show up as my best self for my coworkers and my family, that right there, that's powerful. So when you don't feel like 
meal planning, when you don't feel like kicking off that habit or following through with it this week, you're able to go back to, look, I want to do this. I said that I want to do this so that I can show up as my best self for my family and my coworkers. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. So know your why and articulate your motivation. The second strategy for designing habits that stick is don't decide, design. So often we make the decision, we do this with goals, we do this with New Year's resolutions, and we do this with habits as well. We tell ourselves, I'm going to start waking up at 6 a.m. or I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start eating healthy, or I'm going to start meal planning, for example. Don't just decide and then hope that it all works out and hope that you'll that your willpower will just magically show up whenever it's time to follow through. Take those building blocks that we learned, your cue, your routine, and your reward, and design your habit. What's your cue? What is your cue going to be to kick off the habit? What can you create or what trigger can you, can you create, whether it's setting an alarm on your phone, whether it's placing your vitamin bottle next to your toothbrush, you know, what cue can you design in order to kick off your habit? Next, what's the routine? What is the habit that you want to create? And you know, let's say that you want to begin a habit of running every day. Uh, what all, what are the steps involved to making that happen? It's, you know, putting on your shoes, it's putting on your workout clothes, it's deciding where you're going to run whenever you're very thoughtful about, okay, what are all of the pieces of this routine? You're able to be much more realistic whenever you go to follow through. And then finally, What's your reward? Because that reward is so, so critical for us to continue uh, performing the routine in order to make the, the, the ritual, the, the habit, an ingrained part of our lives. Um, so since it typically takes a while for intrinsic re rewards to kick in, you know, those internal rewards that like, you know, the satisfaction that you feel from working out. A lot of times we work out and we just feel tired and we, we know it was a good thing for us to do. We know that going for that run was good for us, but we just, we're just not feeling that, that inner satis satisfaction quite yet. We're not seeing the pounds fall off just yet. Sometimes those intrinsic rewards can take time. And so while we're waiting for those intrinsic rewards to kick in, Choose an external reward to get you excited and keep you going. So one of the simplest, most inexpensive, yet powerful methods of creating an external reward is using a habit tracker, using a habit tracker. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, it, I'm sure we all know who uh, um, the amazing comedian Jerry Seinfeld is, really credits his success not to being smarter or funnier than anyone else, but to consistency. He, he tells the story of um, whenever he was a young comedian, he put a calendar, one of those big calendars on the wall, the, a big like annual calendar, monthly calendar, quarterly, whatever, but just a big calendar with big blank X's. And so every day that he wrote a new joke to really uh, create that, that put in the reps and build that muscle, that comedic muscle, he would write a joke and then immediately go put an X on the calendar for that day. And so while in the beginning, his first job or his first goal was to write a joke each day, it then transitioned to not breaking the chain. His goal was to not break the chain. Just don't break the chain. Every single day, keep it up, put the X and don't break the chain. So that created a physical activity that signaled that reward. He did what he said that he was going to do. He continued the habit and he has that visual picture of his accomplishments. So one of the most important things, though, to remember about a habit tracker is that you only uh, get that, that feel-good chemical release uh, for that reward if you make the X um, almost immediately after you perform the activity. So let's say that you've got a habit tracker and every day at the end of your day, you think back on the day and you just cross off all the things that you did that were on your habit tracker. This is a technique that a lot of people use. Um, 
But when you wait until the end of the day, you're not connecting, you're not physically connecting, performing the activity with getting the reward of making the X. So if you are someone who uses a habit tracker or you're interested in using a habit tracker to create that visual reward, make sure that right after you perform the activity, you put that X because that's when you'll really begin to strengthen that muscle of um, sticking to that habit. So uh, that was that was a, a little bit of a side path that we just took into a little bit of the science behind habit trackers. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that and take that and run with it. And so the next thing, the next strategy that is incredibly helpful for designing habits that stick is to schedule your habit. So this is very similar to designing your habit, really being intentional about your cue, your routine, and your reward, but bringing even more intention to the cue is scheduling your habit into your day. Um, and Lulu, you know, I, I, that's that's really it. You know, habit trackers can be so helpful, but you've got to make that X right after you perform the activity because that's what links the activity to that reward. And that reward is what's going to keep you going back to the habit time after time. Rewards are huge. Rewards aren't just for fun or for celebration. Rewards are critical to making our habits stick. So we cannot, we have, we've got to celebrate the small wins. And so whenever you carve out space for your habit in your day, so whenever you make time for it and dedicate time to it, it's more likely to happen uh, rather than saying, oh, I'll get to it at some point, decide when. If you're serious about making it happen, decide when. So our fourth strategy for, for designing habits that stick to combat decision fatigue is to pair your habit. Habit pairing or habit stacking is a really great strategy for kicking off a new habit. So essentially, you find something that you already do pretty much on autopilot, and you add your new habit to that routine. So you take basically an existing cue, and you add a new routine to that cue. So let's say that you're trying to form a habit of taking a multivitamin every day. Um, instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to take a vitamin at some point, you can you know, you're probably going to brush your teeth in the morning. At least I hope so. We all should be brushing our teeth in the morning. You can put your vitamin bottle literally next to your toothbrush or next to your toothpaste or something uh, next to something that you use every morning. And that, that vitamin bottle becomes a cue next to the cue to brush your teeth or to do that other habit. And so any existing habits that you have Think through, you know, what are those existing habits and how can I stack another habit with that existing habit? How can you stack it and attack it to add a new habit in with something that you're already doing? And then finally, tie your habit to your identity. I know this one sounds kind of deep, but tie your habit to your identity. So James Clear dives, uh, really dives into this concept in Atomic Habits, but the way we think about and talk about our new habits impacts our ability to stick with them. You know, words matter, our thoughts matter, our internal monologue, the confidence that we have in ourselves, all of this plays a role in our ability to start and stick to habits. So here's how we can do this in a simple way. And, it's, and it really starts with just changing the way that we talk and think about habits. So we'll go back to meal planning. Uh, so instead of saying, I'm going to start meal planning, instead, change that up to, I am someone who meal plans. I'm a meal planner. So maybe you've never meal planned a day in your life and your first meal planning session is scheduled for this Sunday. But by tying your habit, even your brand new habit, like meal planning, to your identity, being someone who meal plans, 
you're going to be more likely to follow through when the time comes so that you can act in alignment with your identity. So this is powerful. This is powerful because we as we as humans want to act in alignment with who we believe that we are. You know, if you believe that you're a good person, you are going to strive to make decisions that align with being a good person. If you believe that you are a good leader or that you're a good manager or that you're a productive worker, you are going to make decisions that align with those identities. And so it's almost a little bit of that fake it till you make it thing. Um, telling yourself, I am someone who closes all of my tabs at the end of the workday. When you tell yourself that I am someone who does that, whenever the time comes for you to do it for the very first time, you're going to be more likely to do it so that you can act in alignment with who you are. And Autumn, I love what you added in the chat. Um, the, then the internal dialogue is I already do this thing. Yes, exactly. So it's like, you've already broken through the heart of it, the, the hard part, you know, we're, we're talking about habits today, but one very powerful way to stick to goals that you've set is to think of your goals um, using the language uh, that you've already accomplished them. So let's say that you have set a goal to get a promotion in 2022. And one thing that you can do every day to keep yourself focused on that goal to get a promotion is to write down, um, I am a senior manager of X, Y, and Z, or I am the vice president of da, 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 da. Because whenever you think in terms of that, that future attainment, you begin to act as if you begin to show up as if you're already there, which, which makes you more likely to make decisions that align with stepping into that, that future role or that future goal. Yeah. Lulu dress for the job you want autumn show up as who you want to be. And so you do, you can do the same thing with habits, tie this to your identity, whatever habit it is, tell yourself, I am someone who works out five days a week. I am someone who, who, like I said earlier, closes my tabs at the end of every day so that I can be more present in the evenings with my family and friends. So like I said, whenever you tie your habits to your identity, you are more likely to follow through so that you can stay in alignment with your identity. So during our time together today, we've done a, a dive into decision fatigue. We know that we're making somewhere around 35,000 decisions of all shapes and sizes every single day. Uh, we're walking away with the fun fact that we make about 250 decisions about food every single day. Um, and we know that habits are the way to put ourselves on a good kind of autopilot so that we're making fewer decisions so that we can conserve that limited amount of decision-making fuel for the decisions that really, really count. And then finally, we've covered five strategies for how to create habits that stick so you can take them, run with them, and start implementing things like acting, uh, tying it to your identity, scheduling your habit, pairing your habit so you can stack an attack, knowing your why, and finally designing your habit versus deciding that you're going to start a habit. So now's the time where I am here to answer any questions that you have about habit forming that we've talked about so far, anything about rewards, intrinsic, extra external rewards that you can set up. Uh, we took, we went off on that tangent about uh, habit trackers. That was a lot of fun. Um, and so any questions that you have, not only about habits or decision fatigue, like, like we've talked about today, but uh, questions about anything relating to time management, serving your teams, productivity, collaboration, Anything you've got, I am here, and I would love to talk through any current challenges you have or any questions that you have right now. We can talk about organization. We can talk about email. 
Um, any, anything that's on your mind, I'm here to stick around and answer any questions that you have in the coaching part. Oh, Veronica, what, this is a great question. Okay. So Veronica asks, I'm curious to know how you deal with people that are resistant to change. You know, this is, um, it, that's such a great topic because I, I feel like things have changed more in the last year and a half than they have in like the last 20 years or something like that. We've experienced so much change and so much has changed so quickly that we've barely had an opportunity to hang on. And so, um, you know, there are so many different types of personalities, right? And as a time management coach, I really like to think about uh, personality driven productivity. And I know that your question isn't directly related to productivity, but trust me, I'm heading there. Um, I really like to think of productivity in terms of personality driven productivity and that it's really important for us to know ourselves and our tendencies in order to create per productivity solutions and strategies that really match up with how we think, how we operate. And so it's the same thing uh, in working with our colleagues and our teams. It's, it's understanding that there are always going to be a lot of different personalities at the table or at the virtual Zoom table uh, since, so, since so many of us are remote. But, but it's that, first of all, that recognition that there are a lot of different personalities at play. And adaptability, which is that ability to you know, adapt to change as it comes, that adaptability is something that differs pretty wi wildly widely, wildly, it differs a lot from person to person. Um, some people are very resistant to all kinds of change. Some people can be very go with the flow. And while others it are just kind of that, it depends. They're willing to adapt to change in some situations, but they're not willing to adapt to change in others. And so it really, it really comes down to getting to the heart of why someone is resistant to change. And, you know, that really comes from asking questions, from asking questions. Um, I really, I'm going to recommend a book. I'm going to pop it into the chat. It's called The Coaching Habit, and I have it on my shelf, um, but I can't see from here who the book is by, but it's called The Coaching Habit. And The Coaching Habit is not just a book for coaches. It is a fantastic book for managers and leaders of all kinds, because in the book, it contains a set of questions that can really help you um, get to the bottom of or uh, really encourage thoughtful discussion with your teammates, with your supervisor, with literally anyone you come in contact with. And it helps you ask questions um, in a way that does not result in uh, defensiveness, because sometimes it's very easy to ask a question like, why, why can't you just go with this? Or, you know, what's the problem here? What, it, it, and that can lead to those who we're talking with um, just kind of becoming a little bit defensive. And then once that happens, all bets are off. And then um, you've got to just wait until things, you know, play out a little bit to, to go back to that original problem. And so I would highly encourage you to um, ask open-ended questions to understand what is causing the resistance. A lot of times a uh, resistance to change can be very fear-based. Uh, maybe um, let's say that this individual is resistant to change in terms of using new technologies. So we've all had to start using a lot of new technologies in the last year to begin communicating. Um, and when someone doesn't feel, for example, comfortable, using certain technology that can make them very resistant to try when someone is afraid that they're not going to be able to get the hang of it. And then therefore may not look as, um, competent as their team members that can make them resistant to change. And so, you know, we talked uh, a few weeks ago about burnout and understanding that there are six different areas of burnout and each area of burnout has to be addressed in its own unique tailored way. And so it's really the same thing here. Um, so Veronica, yes, I would highly encourage you to really dig in and understand what is causing someone to be resistant to change and then use that to very specifically um, 
you know, help, help them work through whether, whatever that fear or whatever that reluctance is. So yes, check out the coaching habit. I highly recommend the coaching habit to literally everyone. Uh, it's so good for collaborating with team members, for talking with your supervisor, for leading people that uh, your direct reports. It really is a fantastic book with very, very powerful questions. Um, Lulu, that is such a, such a great question. Do you have any tips on prioritizing? For example, I have multiple habits I want to start. How do I decide which one to work on first? So first of all, I will absolutely commend you and give you a high five for asking this question. How do I decide which one to work on first? Because one of the biggest pitfalls in adopting new habits is trying to start too many habits at once. So a lot of times we'll wake up on January 1st and we decide, oh, it's January 1st. I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm going to run five miles today and I'm going to revamp my diet and I'm going to alphabetize my CD collection and I'm going to do all of these things. And it's just completely overwhelming. And then we do none of it and then we give up. And we don't want to do that, right? We, we want to be very intentional. So one really, one best practice, one good strategy that we didn't cover in the five today is uh, really deciding which habit you want to start on first and get that one going before uh, you start adding in additional habits so that you give that one time to sink in. So there's been a lot of different um, dates thrown around. How many days does it take to make something a habit? Is it 21? Is it 67? Is it 127? They've really been all over the place. Well, here's the thing. There's no magic number of days that it takes to make a habit ingrained. But whenever you intentionally design a habit with a cue, a routine, and reward, you are more likely to make that habit stick sooner than if you just decide and hope that it happens. But let's talk about prioritizing. So here's another, here's another book because um, I love the books. And it's called The One Thing. And this one is by Gary Keller and Jay Papa's on. It's a really great listen if you happen to have Audible or if you're into listening to books, it's really great. And in The One Thing, this book is really about focus. Uh, they talk about the importance of going really narrow in order to make a really big impact. Um, and so they, they, what they recommend is asking this question and they call it the focusing question. And it goes like this, what is the one thing such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. I'm going to say it one more time. What is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else is easier or unnecessary? So I would encourage you to think about the habits that you want to start and ask yourself, okay, of these habits that I want to start, which one, if I start it first, will make the rest easier? Which one, if I start it first, will make the rest easier? So here's an example. Like, let's say that you want to start working out in the morning before work, that you want to meditate in the morning before work, and that you want to start waking up earlier, that you want to start waking up at like 6.30. Um, of those three, what is going to make the other two easier waking up early? So that one is going to make the other two easier. So I would really encourage you to think through the habits that you want to start with that lens, which one, um, would make the others feel easier. And if they're all completely like unrelated, just ask yourself, which of these is going to be most fun to me because we're going to be more likely to do the things that we think are fun or enjoyable. So yes, I would encourage you to think through which habit is going to make the rest of the habits feel easier, or if they're all equal, just do whatever feels the most fun. Um, Ooh, Autumn, I'd love to learn more about the startup and shutdown routines for the workday that you mentioned last office hours. What habits or routines can we incorporate there that would be most powerful? Well, Autumn, I'm so glad you asked because 
your action items for today. First, I encourage you to share your biggest takeaway with Clockwise Office Hours, the hashtag Clockwise Office Hours. I encourage you to take action on at least one habit forming strategy that you learned today. And then finally, I encourage you to register for the next Clockwise Office Hours, which is all about the five essential routines for a sustainable work week, Autumn. The five essential routines for a sustainable work week. Spoiler alert, yes, I will be talking all about the startup and shutdown routines and three other essential routines that really can help you show up as your best self and build a more sustainable a more sustainable work week. Oh my gosh, Lulu, I love it. Veronica, can't wait to see you there. Um, I, I love seeing you guys uh, week after week or office hours after office hours. So be sure to go ahead and register for the next office hours. And while you're at it, share office hours with someone else who you know might enjoy learning a little bit more about routines and who could really, uh, who you think would really benefit or enjoy um, just making life just a little bit easier because, you know, that's exactly what we aim to do here at Office Hours is to provide you with tips and strategies that you can easily take action on so that you can make time for what matters. You know, that's what we're on a mission to do here at Clockwise is to help you make time for what matters. You know, we believe that the time between meetings is the most important part of our day and being able to use that time well, being able to use that time in a well that helps you feel accomplished, productive, um, that enables you to be present when you're in your off hours so that you can focus on the people that matter most. Um, that's what fuels us. And that's what keeps us, you know, you know, doing what we do. So I want to thank you guys as always for, for signing up, for carving out this time, for doing this for you, because, you know, this is your time. This is your time to, to, to walk away with these tips and strategies so that you can implement them and make life just a little bit easier, not just for yourself, but for your teammates as well, because this is all very shareable, teachable um, info that you can, that you can use to help others as well. So that is it for today. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me, for being here, for asking such amazing questions, for always uh, showing up with such energy in the chat box. It's always so awesome. Um, and yeah, I thank you guys so much. I'm going to stick around for just a little bit longer if you guys have any more questions. Uh, and if not, I will see you on February 2nd at 11 Pacific to talk all about the five essential routines. All right, you guys have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week.